that resemblance. Um, circuit diagrams are very complicated in this way. They involve all three kinds of signs, but a certain amount of it is iconic in the sense that where the, where the wires go is iconically represented by the, by the diagram. Um, in decibels, as I said, uh, there's a causal relationship or a spatiotemporal relationship between the, the, the marker and the, uh, the, the sign and the thing signified. You tie a string around your finger, right? I, I don't know how it, it, it's a classic. Has anybody ever tied a string around his or her finger? And how would you do it? Um, I mean, you have to get somebody else to tie a string around your finger, right? And why don't you say, instead of tying a string around, just remind me, right? Because somebody else did. Um, <coughs> in any event, the idea is I look at the string on my finger that I remember the, it causes me to remember the time at which it was tied, or that there was something, there's some connection of that sort. Um, the blaze on a tree I mentioned, the mailbox flag, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the paint mark of a, of a hand or a fingerprint is obviously caused by, if it uses a sign, is caused by the presence of, of a hand. The notches on a gun, uh, each, uh, if people still do that, uh, corresponding to the number of people who have been killed with that gun, is in, 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 in all resters. Um, and finally, symbols. Uh, as I say, these are arbitrary. The G clef, you know, has no, there's no relationship between the form of that, uh, that sign and the thing it signifies that we're in a certain scale. Uh, just the word tree, um, or the, um, uh, uh, just, yeah, just the word tree and, and, and so forth. These are all perfectly arbitrary relations between signs and symbols. Now, when we are looking at the earliest stages of uh, representation, um, we're going to see indexicals and we're going to see uh, icons. We're not going to see symbols. Why are we not going to see symbols? Because if, 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 if they were, we wouldn't know what they were. Right? We wouldn't know that they were symbols because it would be arbitrary relations. We've got no way of figuring that, that out. There are, though, these early indexical signs. We talked about, I mentioned these, uh, uh, these knots, bones, and sticks, tally sticks. Uh, they're sometimes called a knotted rope, a knot stick, where every time something happens, uh, you do something. You make a notch in a stick, let's say, to record the passage of days. Uh, and then um, that stick stands in a relationship or representation to the, the number of days that are passed. You can do this even if you don't have a number system. You can't count past, past five uh, in your language. Um, and these are found widely in, in this period, in, in, in numerous sites um, and cultures. Um, these can get really quite complicated. Um, the most interestingly complicated is the, uh, uh, the uh, indexical system used by the Incas. The Incas are because they had this incredibly sophisticated civilization and no writing system. Um, but they did have lots of, keep lots of records of how many people live in this village, how many people live in this village, how much corn has been produced, who's paid taxes, who hasn't paid taxes, how many young men of <coughs> so to speak, draft days there are, whatever. How did they do that? Um, they did that with uh, 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 an artifact called the kipu, uh, which was basically um, a number of strings tied together of different colors and thicknesses with knots in them. And each of these knots represented as a notch stick does, the number of men in the village, the number of taxes paid, the amount of corn, and so on and so forth. Um, there were um, a group of, let's say, clerks uh, who were charged with maintaining these and keeping the records. Obviously, they had to have a huge amount of background knowledge uh, in order to do that. You had to know that the red string here on this one represents corn or um, uh, population or taxes, and, um, and that this one represents something else. Um, but these were um, uh, extraordinarily elaborate, uh, kept by this, uh, this group, and were used until the uh, Inca conquest by Pizarro in the, uh, in the 16th century. Um, obviously, there, there are only a certain number of things you can record here. You can record quantity of things in a category, um, and you have to have enormous amounts of instruction just to be able to, to interpret these things. Um, icons, as well, uh, are used extensively in this period. Um, <coughs> to the point where um, uh, there begin to emerge what one could say was representational systems that used purely icons uh, to stand for um, uh, complicated uh, relationships. Um, here are just some various examples. Here, for example, uh, is a, a letter of credence, basically a, a good faith letter, um, submitted by uh, the Chippewa delegation um, who went to Washington in 1849, I think to ask that certain lakes be maintained in their reservation. I believe that was what was going on. But they, they gave this letter of credence. And it's understood as meaning, this is uh, the, the guy on the right, the president in his house, in the White House. On the left is the lower one, the, the, I'm, I'm talking about here. Uh, uh, there's the, um, the chief um, uh, Marked with the, um, as the eagle, because he's of the eagle clan, there's another of the catfish clan. Uh, they're in accord, as uh, shown by the lines between them. And so these, these got quite uh, complicated. The one on the upper left, uh, is, let me this one. Uh, the one on the upper left uh, is a love letter um, uh, by, uh, uh, I believe it's an Ojibwe love letter. Uh, let's see, the, the girl belongs to the bear clan. Three of her friends are Christians. Um, they live in these two tents. Oh, this is their, their house. Near two lakes, it's being sent to the, the, the guy. If you, like, if you can't see it, but there's a hand sticking out of one of the tents. He's, you know, welcome. You come over and see me sometimes, basically. Right? Uh, but, but these could be used in, in fairly specific ways. Like the people, they require a lot of contextual information uh, to interpret. Um, here's one extraordinary example uh, from um, uh, Siberia. Um, may have been a game, may have an actual love letter. Um, the idea here, well, it's pretty clear what this means, right? Okay, all right. Um, the, uh, the sender uh, is the, the woman, uh, who's the second from the right. Um, she's thinking about uh, her former boyfriend, who's the, let's see, the third from the right, who's with a Russian girl. Uh, as you can tell from the uh, little braids she's got, the Russian girl's wearing braids. Um, they're not getting along, you can see by the cross out there. Um, and she's, but she, the, the original girl, um, the first girl, one second to the right, is being hit on by this other guy, right? And she's saying to this guy, look, um, I know you're fighting with that Russian girl you broke up with me over. I'm unhappy in my house. There's a house, as I think of you, but you should know that there's another guy hitting on me, so get your act together before I get married and have children. Right? That's, who needs language? It's not clear, as I say, whether this was an elaborate game or whether these were actually used, but, but they show the extent to which these systems, with appropriate contextual information, um, can be used um, to, um, uh, to communicate things. Um, now, how do you get past if you've got a pictographic system of this sort? That is, using pictures to convey ideas. Um, how do you get past the limitations of things you can't picture? Um, for instance, there are all kinds of unpicturable things in this. People fighting and thinking about other people and even uh, children. And so how, how, do you, how, do you uh, how do you symbolize those? Well, <coughs> one thing you can do, and this is an important step for the development of writing, is to use these things metaphorically. You can picture a foot. So you can use a picture of a foot for go. Uh, you can picture um, a person in a mountain. That can be the symbol for a foreigner. Um, uh, eye and water becomes the symbol for weep uh, and so on. And so we use these. Many of our icons actually work this way. When you have the eye heart, whatever eye heart, SF eye heart, whatever it is, eye heart, perfectly. Um, uh, what's the heart? Well, the heart is a highly conventionalized uh, representation of. Um, uh, of, of the heart. The heart is associated with love. We can't picture love, uh, but we can picture something that's associated with it, and then by convention that will be the sign for, for love. Um, that's a picture of a glass, but, that, but when we use that icon, what do we use it for? We don't use it to say there's a glass here. Fragile, right, it's fragile. Well, we picture something that's fragile to depict fragility that we can't picture. Um, that lower, people know the lower, the icon on the lower right? I asked this once before, nobody knew what it is. It's a common piece of software. It's fetch. Yeah, fetch is the thing you go to, you know, to, to, to get files, uh,
Yeah, your name is Patrick. Yeah. Yeah, just that one. Well, no, tell me about the second one. Then. What would the second one be? You're not borrowing my car, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, you want to check your name is. What, what, what temperature? Um, um, you got to keep asking names. So fifth and seventh time, you have to give me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so you, yeah, and your name is again. Yeah. Turn on, turn the key. If the car is cold, don't step on the gas pedal. This is this is just a, you know. Uh, if it's warm, depress the gas pedal halfway as you turn the key. Obvious, right? I mean, it's, it's, you're all, <laughs> um, it takes a lot of contextual information uh, to uh, to understand these. Um, uh, uh, let me let me just move on because uh, um, uh, this, well, let's move on. Uh, um, these systems in which symbols, signs stand directly for ideas or concepts or things um, can do a great deal. Um, uh, the most uh, extensive, important, in fact, uh, a system we, we could not do without is the, 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 the sign system of mathematics and logic and so on. Um, if you think about it, um, this the numeral five represents that that numeral, right, or that uh, that, that number. Uh, it doesn't represent the word five. Right? If, if you see a five, I think five, you might think uh, fun for uh, chingue or wu or whatever, depending on your language, but it's the same thing. It isn't as if that number stands for wu or chingue or five, it stands for the number five. When you see uh, the, uh, the formula I've written here, uh, which we in English would pronounce as 10 to the ninth equals uh, a billion, um, uh, you know, in Italian things, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it, right? So that's just English and French and Italian German ways of pronouncing it. It stands for that notion. Uh, and similarly, uh, in first order logic, uh, you know, we say for all x, f of x, and g of x, but you can pronounce that even in English a lot of ways. You know, anything that's f is g. Uh, if you find an f, you're for sure going to find a g. That's going to be a g. Yeah, there are all kinds of ways to do that. Other languages don't have ways to do that. The language of mathematics is purely semasiographic. It's, it's a direct symbol. It directly signifies ideas or things. It doesn't go through language. Um, and um, you can do a lot, obviously, with mathematics. It's not clear if such a system could be designed without going through language that would express everything that people might want to express. We will, in the uh, I'll just mention it here, John Wilkins, we'll talk about him later. So I won't spend any time on this uh, extraordinary character from the 17th century, um, um, designed uh, what was called a uh, universal language, in which these um, uh, geometric figures would um, would would be sort of mathematics of all experience, in which uh, that sign, for example, I have appeared denoted. Uh, forever and ever uh, by composition of various ideas. And we will talk about this later. Um, nonetheless, um, to do that, uh, what you really need is writing, representation of language. Now, when I talk about uh, writing as a linguist, uh, the thing I find extraordinary is that we are also steeped in the culture, in, in a literary culture. We learned to write early on, and I'll, I'll explain next time. We were literate long before we learned A, B, and C, before we learned our letters. We, we grew up in this society. Most of us were literate by the time we were one and a half, two. I mean, was, um, and so the idea of using signs to represent speech, uh, spoken language, and to refer to the world via uh, the, the, the speech that we represent, um, seems to us so natural that it's hard to understand how hard it was to come up with it, what a concept it was, why it was only invented a few times in the history of, of, of actually invented as opposed to borrow, uh, in, in, in the history of the universe. Um, the idea that um, those noises that I represented there in a, in a speech spectrograph, um, um, uh, I did it phonetically just because to make it less so we were right, but that's, uh, anybody can know the IPA? No linguists? The International Phonetic Alphabet? The IPA? No? No? Okay. Uh, that's, um, I, don't even, uh, I don't even know what we're going to do. I don't even know what we're going to do. Uh, that's, that, that's the spectrograph of that. Of that, uh, of that sense. But, you know, what you've got is, right? It's like listening to a foreign language, you just hear this noise. The idea that you can take that and invent a system to represent it took thousands of years to come up with it and invent it a few times. Um, uh, what's the idea? Well, basically, the idea is that rather than having signs that directly represent things in the world, we'll have signs initially that represent the items in our language that represent things in the world, and by representing the items in our language, the words, the phonemes, the, the morphemes, the phonemes, the we'll be able to refer to the world indirectly via uh, the language. So rather than having horse, you know, a symbol directly for a horse, we'll represent the English word horse uh, and, that, and thereby refer to a horse in, in that way. Um, uh, and, you know, if it's English, we do it that way. If it's, uh, if it's Chinese, uh, we, have, we have Chinese speakers here. Nobody? Yeah. Okay. So it's ma, ma, right? Ma, ma. It's just four of them, five of them. Um, we represent that word um, with a symbol uh, that represents that word and then refers to horses indirectly uh, via, via, via that word. Um, uh, these are, you can think of these as, as uh, people might, might describe as glottographic writing. There might be other systems of writing, but you can think of different systems of writing. But glottographic writing, glotto from the Greek uh, for language. Um, uh, writing that represents language um, um, rather than referring directly to, to, to things in the world. So the symbol, the numeral five, represents the, the number five directly. The words five and fun, fin, wu, and whatever represent, uh, represent the number five. Via, via the language, or the, 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 the written versions of those represent those spoken forms which represent uh, the number five. Uh, we have a dollar sign that represents dollars directly. We can also write the word dollars, which represents the word dollars, which represents dollars. Uh, um, uh, it started in Sumer. It all started in Sumer, um, uh, present day Iraq, uh, near, near southeast Iraq, um, uh, several millennia ago. Um, nobody's quite sure, and this is um, uh, <coughs> something that's touched on your reading, I believe. Um, nobody's quite sure how it got going. There's one very popular, intriguing theory um, that has a lot of followers. Um, that it began with these, with these little clay tokens. Um, here's the idea. You had a commercial culture. People were trading things like sheep and barrels of oil or whatever and bushels of, 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 of corn. Whatever. And um, in order to keep records, they make little tokens that represent, say, sheep. You have a number of sheep tokens. Um, and if we make a contract, I'll take a number of these sheep tokens. I'll put them into a clay ball, which then hardens. So it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, the tokens are rattling around. That becomes a contract, and I give it to you. And we have a dispute over, you know, you said eight sheep. Where's the eight sheep? Um, we just break the ball open. 
and so we say, oh, HHC, what do we do about it anyway? Uh, uh, that, was the, that was a way of keeping records. And at a certain point, people said, yeah, but you know, if I have to find out what's in there, break the thing to find out what's in there every time, there's no way so I can know what's in there without breaking. Well, you can actually take the token, which has been uh, impressed into the surface of the ball, the bula, as it's called. Um, it's impressed into the surface of the ball, um, and make little marks, right? If you make eight little sheet marks with a sheet token, that will mean there are eight tokens inside. Uh, so that was uh, a way of representing what was inside. And then another point is, wait a second, why do we even need the, this is all the clay, after all, why do we even need the, the, the tokens inside? We've got the marks on the outside, that's hardened now, that's our record. Uh, and so the idea is that with those marks produced by the impression of the tokens originally from these balls and then it's just, uh, a tablet of clay writing a ball. Uh, there's a woman that tested these, Shemont Besserai, who's uh, uh, developed this theory. It's, as I say, uh, popular, but, uh, but not universally accepted. Um, in any event, uh, <coughs> on her story, um, these, uh, these signs um, began then with these little bullies, little, uh, these little tokens, um, and as impressed in the clay, and gradually became uh, more and more abstract uh, to represent sheep and, uh, I can't read this here, um, um, garments and bracelets and perfumes on the beginning of these concrete things that people were actually, actually trading. Um, by the, um, about, uh, about 4,500 years ago, um, you've got uh, this system of cuneiform. Cuneiform is a little wedge because that's how the, uh, the, the marks are made in clay. Um, that represents, uh, that can represent most of the stuff in a language. It's a script. And as a script, it could then be borrowed and used for other languages. Obviously, when you adopt a script, you have to change a lot because it's designed to represent the sounds and structures of one language, and you have to change it to represent uh, the sounds and structures uh, of another. Um, it's borrowed for other languages, for Babylonian and Assyrian. Um, and by 1750 BC, it's used for the Code of Hammurabi. People have heard of the Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi, the first code of laws, and so on. In fact, what, what do you want to write in a society like this? I mean, this is not a society like ours where people get up in the morning and, you know. Read the newspaper. That's what people used to do in the morning. Um, yeah, these things called newspapers now. Um, uh, you keep commercial records, obviously. That's an important thing to keep because it's, if there's a dispute, you want to have a, a permanent record of it in some sense. Uh, calendars and dates, obviously enormously important, particularly for society uh, whose life uh, is, is based both on the, um, the um, uh, agricultural seasons and on uh, repeated rituals that are connected to those. Or, you know, anything you have to say just so. You know, uh, if, like a title, you know, King of Kings, Hair Doctor, Professor, or whatever, that has to be said in exactly the right way, uh, you, you, you want to write. Um, laws and proclamations, obviously, uh, this sort of thing, again, you, you want to say it just so because each word matters, you want it to be the same from one instance to another. Liturgical texts, that is, say prayers and uh, other religious texts. Poetry, um, or certain forms of poetry. We, we, we'll talk about that next time, but um, by the uh, 7th century BC, um, you have uh, forms of poetry like the epic of, of, of Gilgamesh, um, um, uh, which is um, written in, in, I think it was in Akkadian, uh, no, yes, um, the, the original tablets are in Akkadian, I think it's written in Akkadian, I'm not sure, um, but it's an elaborate epic poem written in Kineaform. By this time it's being used for a wide range of things. It is not yet, and we'll talk about this next time, filling the roles that writing fills in a genuinely universally saturated society, I mean, society saturated with literacy like, uh, like our own. Um, along the way, what happens is that the, um, the symbols themselves become increasingly more abstract. If they were pictographic, that is, they look like the things they represented to begin with, uh, they became uh, increasingly, um, increasingly less so. Um, the sign for a head began as the thing on the, the upper left and turned into the thing on the upper right, um, and, and so forth. Um, <coughs> so ultimately, what you want to get is a really complete glygraphic system. You want a system that can represent not just the English words cat and dog and maybe go, but, um, but anything you can say in English, including prepositions and suffixes and plural markers and all the things that, that, have, that essentially can't be pictured or, or represented uh, directly. How do you do that? Uh, how do you symbolize even a notion like creation or a relation like after or a notion like but? What kind of sign would you use to, to indicate buttness? Um, well, one way we saw it was this metaphorical extension, using the symbol for foot to mean go uh, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, hand to mean workman or work. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, another principle. Um, is what's called the rebus principle. Anybody know what a rebus is? Uh, I don't think, uh, you know these things, I don't think they call them rebus anymore. Um, there are these little games, you know, on the back page of the comics, so on, on, on Sunday with the kids, they have little games, there's pictures of things together with letters, you have to guess what it says, right? So for example, these, in the 19th century, I actually had a bunch of rebus plates from, from France in the 19th century, they were very popular. Um, <coughs> here's one on the lower left. Um, uh, I, I, I found I couldn't what language it was, but I'm trying to do it. Um, but here's a simple rebus, a sentence in rebus form. What, what does that say? What are those five symbols say? That's an English sense. You, very good, who's with you? You. I saw you. I saw you duck here. <laughs> here, just here. I saw you duck here. Um, okay, I mean, <laughs> um, I'm, we're going to see a lot of rubber duckies, a recurring theme I can say here. Um, right, what's the idea here? The idea is we don't have a way of picturing the concept that's represented by the first person singular pronoun I. We do have a word as it happens that denotes something that can be pictured, the I. Um, that sounds the same as that pronoun does. Um, so we can picture the I, the thing that, to, to represent something that sounds like it, uh, or that has the same sound, uh, the pronoun I. Um, and this is the principle, this rebus principle, whereby these languages were expanded, these systems were expanded to represent everything in the language. Um, <coughs> in Sumerian, uh, there was a word for water, law. Uh, there was another word, the preposition in, that was pronounced law. So they used the word for water, the sign for water, uh, also for the preposition in. Uh, makes sense. Uh, the word for oracle may uh, happen also to be uh, the, uh, the, the word for the plural suffix. So they used that for man. And it got, more complicated. it got more complicated. You add additional signs to indicate which, which way you were using the sign and so on. It, it, it wasn't that simple. But this was the basic principle whereby these systems were expanded to represent everything in uh, the language. Um, ultimately, uh, you wind up uh, having these represent representations of words, these symbols for words, um, standing not so much for the word as a concept as for the word as a phonetic object, like, like for example, a syllable. For example, we have these. We have a few logographs, that is to say, the symbols that, 